Hello, BookTube. We're continuing with my library tour for 2022. Uh, we're making our way around my little book room, shelf by shelf. I've played around with some camera angles here in an attempt to make this a little more comfortable. I think this is working. Uh, and we are starting this next shelf. This is a tall, uh, thin, deep shelved, narrow bookcase that was custom made for me. I intentionally had it made because I was always dealing with little spaces whether it's the right angle of a corner or some other pokey hole uh, where a normal bookcase wouldn't go. And I didn't have any bookcases that fit those spaces. And the thing about tall, thin, square, deep bookcases is that if you want to just line them up next to each other, you can. They work for the larger spaces, but they're the only things that works for the smaller spaces. So uh, the, this bookcase is notable for its tall shelves. It's, it's, it's a really tall bookcase, but it's got tall shelves, so you can know with this bookcase, I don't have, and with a lot of these others, I don't have to worry about, you know, an oversized book. It can still go on the shelf. It doesn't have to go in some special ghetto of its own. Uh, and you can see that in the batch of books that we have first. These are all oversized collections of New Yorker cartoons. This one is from 1925 to 1975. Uh, this one is from 1950 to 1955. So I just, when I find these things, I get them. Uh, and the reason why you may, you might, you know, you might look at these and say, well, those years are covered in this one. The ones, that, the books, the years in this are covered in this. But in order to fit cartoons into this, a lot of the ones that are included in this more specific albums have to be left out. They, they, so you're going to miss things if you don't get the individual issues, the individual years. Uh, then we have, <laughs> this is a... Uh, 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 a New Yorker album for 1925 to 1950. So you can see the 1925 to the 1950 one is about the same width as the 1925 to the 1972 one. So that, that demonstrates what I'm talking about, which is that they will often have uh, stuff cut out. Stuff uh, Cartoons will be omitted. Uh, then what do we have here? Uh, okay, this is just 1942. This is just wartime. The Yorker used to come out with one of these every year. Uh, at first, they didn't know how successful they would be, so they just numbered them. The first was just called an, a cartoon album. I think the second was called an, a cartoon album. Then the third, the third one was called a car, the third cartoon album. Uh, this is a war album. Just World War II. So I think this came out in the 1942? Yeah, 1942. Uh, still in perfect condition. I just... Uh, I grab these things whenever I see them, so, uh, and I have other New Yorker cartoon collections scattered throughout this room. They really shouldn't be. This shelf is just big enough, just the right size for all of them, so they should all be here, and they will be. <laughs> they will be. Uh, then this next one is from National Geographic. This is a great book. It's The Visual Galaxy, and it takes you through uh, not just the latest high resolution imagery that we have of all of the things in our galaxy but also because it's national geographic you have great uh visuals artificial visuals made by their visual staff of like this for instance is all of the probes that earth has sent to the sun they're given year lines to differentiate who sent them and how long they lasted and whatnot uh, you have the size of the solar system. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? And so on and so forth so all throughout here. National Geographic books are great anyway. They are, they are fantastic anyway. But for, for something on the whole of the galaxy, that is, just, that is just great. This is not the only National Geographic book in this room. Um, might not even be the only one on this shelf. Uh, then we have one. This is fairly a fairly recent uh, acquisition. This is by John Harris, and it's The Architect and the British Country House, 1620. To 1920. Uh, I have a real soft spot for British country houses. This gives you not only the houses, but the house plans, wherever they can be reconstructed or whether they can be uh, made later on if no original plans survive. Uh, okay. All right. Then we have a bunch of kids' books. I don't know. I have a whole shelf of kids' books in another room. So I don't know what these are doing here. I guess they are my favorites, but still. Uh, this first one is. Uh, by Jackie French, illustrated by Bruce Watley, and it is Diary of a Wombat, <laughs> in which, in which a, a lovable but dim-witted wombat uh, goes through his daily routine, first of all, on Monday morning, 
slept, afternoon, slept, evening, ate grass, scratched, night, ate grass, <laughs> slept. <laughs> uh, and uh, eventually what happens is that this wombat discovers a home, a human home. First, it does battle with this weird thing on the front doorstep <laughs> on the welcome mat. And then it starts demanding food and won't go away. <laughs> uh, absolutely delightful. One of those great children's picture books that, you know, you end up liking more yourself than a kid's ever going to like. Then we have, uh, this is uh, illustrated by the great Ted Rand, one of my favorite children's books illustrators. This is uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's The Ride of Paul Revere, uh, that school children used to memorize. Uh, Paul, Paul Rand is, uh, uh, does such a, or Ted Rand does such a great job with moonlight. I swear, his moonlight is incredible. Uh, I have had at one point or another pretty much everything that I think he's done. I like some of it more than others just for the subject matter. Uh, okay, this is Audrey Wood. This is with drawings by Robert Florzak, and this is Birdsong. Lovely older children's picture book about, uh, the various, look at that artwork, just the various birds that you might find out in the wilderness. Uh, I think I know. I can guess what other things will be here if these are my favorite kids' books. Yes, okay, here's another one of my all-time favorite kids' books, also illustrated by Ted Rand. This is written by Bill Martin and John Archambault, and it's Barn Dance. Uh, I have a couple of copies of this. Again, beautiful moonlight. Just beautiful. The way he uses, his moon is yellow. And all of the moonlight is yellow, and yet it doesn't feel that way. Because of the, the way he works in the shadows of other objects, it doesn't feel like it's sunlight. Uh, and this is about a skinny kid who hears music wafting up from the family barn and gets there just in time to see a barn dance. <laughs> it's just delightful. I think I've read it to you before. Uh, what else have we got here? Uh, okay, this is uh, uh, illustrated by C.F. Payne. This is Ernest Thayer's Casey at the Bat. Uh, the famous the famous poem about uh, a great baseball contest in Mudville, uh, and the uh, and the great Casey who comes to bat uh, assured of victory. Only uh, it doesn't happen that way. <laughs> it doesn't happen that way at all. The umpire throws uh, the pitcher throws a ball and Casey swings and uh, misses. <laughs> the pitcher throws another ball in case he swings and misses and all of a sudden it's deadly serious as you can see. <laughs> uh, and I think, any, any, I won't spoil it, but any of you who know uh, the story know how that third pitch goes. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, then uh, one of my favorite kids' books, although again, I'm not 100% sure how much a kid would get out of this. This is by Eve Bunting and it is I Am the Mummy Head Neffert. This is absolutely delightful. It brings a, a lump to my throat every time I read it. Uh, and that's with me as an adult. <laughs> uh, and then, oh, okay. Uh, and then the last one of this batch is the book that I am contractually obligated to say is my favorite children's book ever. This is Make Way for Ducklings, a quintessential Boston book <laughs> in, which, in which a family of ducks goes to... Uh, the public garden and sees the swan boats <laughs> and uh, and eventually sets up residence on an island. Uh, they go, they, they fly over the state house. They're looking for a home. Uh, the mother duck and the father duck are looking for a home and eventually they find one. Uh, it's, it's immortalized by statues here in Boston. It is known to uh, parents far and ride. I love it, of course, so <laughs> I guess I'll have to say that it's my favorite kid's book. Uh, Okay, then we have a graphic novel. This is not with my other graphic novels, any of them. Uh, it's fantastic. I was very happy to see this. I think I got this as a present from one of you. Uh, I got the original issues of these things from IDW a long, long time ago. Uh, these, this is a comic book adaptation of uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula by Francis Ford Coppola. Uh, a weird movie. A weird adaptation of Dracula starring Gary Oldman as... Uh, weird Dracula and also Keanu Reeves <laughs> trying to do a British accent. There's a whole Anthony Hopkins is in it as well as an absolutely cartoonish Van Helsing. And uh, I think the movie is very interesting. <laughs> there are certainly parts of it that are very interesting. Uh, it Dorky, but interesting. I don't quite know what's going on in that movie, but uh, the comic book adaptation was done by Mike Mignola, the, the, the great artist Mike Mignola. 
uh, who right after this went on to create his own character, Hellboy, and ride it to multi-million dollar success. Hellboy has been in movies. The, the comics are still ongoing. There's tons and tons of merchandise. Uh, this, this is a fantastic adaptation of the movie of Bram Stoker's Dracula. So it's not really a, the, the, you know, the be-all, end-all graphic novel of, uh, of Bram Stoker's novel, although it comes closer than anything, for instance, that Marvel Comics ever did. Uh, Ah, okay. Here's another example of uh, something that's come up often uh, on this channel. Uh, this is uh, a work of classical literature. So it belongs with all the other works of classical literature. This is uh, translated by Apostolos Athanasakis, Athana, Athanasakis, Athanasakis. Uh, and it's the Homeric Hymns, which I have in a couple of different translations, including by George Chapman, but I don't I don't have any in English that I prefer to this, uh, but you know, so I'm glad that it's in this room. But what's it doing here? What's it doing on this shelf? As opposed to, I ought to have all of the classics of Greece and Rome that I have in this room coll collected into one shelf. Uh, and then finally, I was right. We have a second National Geographic volume. This is their huge book, The Splendor of Birds. Uh, I went steady with this book for a long time when I first got it. When did I first get this? Uh, October of 2018. So we must have, I must have hauled it on this channel. I fell in love with it. It is unbelievable. Just, just unbelievably beautiful from, with, with full color photos. Again, just like with the Visual Galaxy, it's got full color photos and also tons and tons of, uh, of text as well on what, on what, you know, the, the staggering variety of birds in the world. Uh, I love it. I, I very much love it. I'm not, I'm not, uh, criticizing that, but uh, in a perfect organization of this library, all the bird books would be together. They aren't right now. They're all over the place, but they they should be all together. Uh, maybe there's a reason why, maybe part of the reason why some of these things are here and not with their kin is because they're in this room. Because this room is for my favorite books. Maybe? <laughs> we're not, we're not... We're not that far off, I'd say probably a couple of months away from the end of this room. And when that happens, I'm going to stop this library tour for a while until I fix this room. Uh, but right now I'm just noting, that's all. <laughs> and I don't think this camera arrangement is going to work next time. So uh, we're, uh, a chair, maybe a stool, something, <laughs> we'll find out. Well, I'll, I'll figure it out and I'll join you next time. Thank you.